Okay. Um, yeah, Banna with us. Doesn't need any more introduction than that. Um, lots to chat about. Yeah, I don't know if this hour will be enough, but let's cover something, and then we can always have some offline conversations that could continue. Um, thank you for coming, first of all. Oh, I feel privileged. <laughs> okay, um, a few different subjects, but all, uh, in a way, they, they link into each other. And the first one that I want to pick up, uh, Badna, is something that uh, you've espoused for a long time now. You uh, call yourself sustainability activist, and you are actively active, right? Um, in fact, there is uh, your... Um, from here going to Bombay on jury duty again on the circular design, um, the first circular design uh, award. Uh, we have one of our alumni who's in the top uh, six finalists and uh, we are um, uh, we'll, we'll very much look forward to what, uh, what happens there. Um, tell us what you've seen happening in the world, and uh, what sustainability means to you. Uh, so before I take this massive platform of saying sustainability activist, I do it within uh, the field that I'm, I'm in. I'm a writer, I'm a journalist, uh, so I talk about sustainability, I write about sustainability. I encourage designers to look at their businesses and see how sustainable it can be. Uh, as I was telling a lot of you, you're starting out new businesses in your strategy to have a sustainable program that grows along with your brand is the most viable thing that you can do because eventually you'll have to be sustainable. You don't be one of those big designers in India today who have mammoth industries but they don't know how to turn around and uh, not harm the environment anymore because they didn't build it from ground up. So I speak about it a lot. I, when I travel all over the world, I'm very, very lucky to be part of Copenhagen Fashion Summit, which is the biggest, most powerful summit on sustainability in the world, where biggest stakeholders, all your fast fashion companies, the heads of uh, H&M, Nike, all of them come to the table, and we are all uh, trying to see how we can adhere as a collective to the United Nations Goals 2030. And there's been m m massive progress being made, because you can see big companies like H&M who've committed to being a circular economy by 2020-30. Now, what is circular economy? Like, it's extremely important, especially because you're literally on the drawing board with starting your companies. Like, we've spent too much time in our lives with the whole notion that whatever we produce is a linear. So it's take, make, waste. And we've done this for decades and decades and decades. And it's harmed the environment to the point where some of the, the, the footprint we've left behind is irreparable, right? So Circular says, whatever you take, the life cycle of a product, whatever you create, when it ends, has to be the beginning of another life cycle. So it's take, make, take, make, take, make. So it becomes a circular loop, and you're not filling landfills. You're not disposing rubbish. So it, it, it becomes um, a, a very mindful practice, um, and also a viable and profitable practice. There's research after research that's done during Copenhagen Fashion Summit. They come out with what's called the FALS, and I urge you to please go onto the website, download. They have, every year they bring out what's called Pulse of the Industry Report. So what's the pulse of the industry? And though it sounds very specifically to fashion, it really is about lifestyle consumption, okay? And so there it shows us that you can make, there's, so, there's trillions of dollars to be made if companies become sustainable. So the whole fallacy that sustainability will actually pull down sales, all that, it's been debunked. So if nothing else, the profitability, the, the, the profit incentive is one that can also be a great level of encourager for you to rethink how you do your business. One thing I notice, which I find sad, because you know, I can say this because I'm from this country, I've studied here, and I see the good and the bad in our education systems. 
I really feel there's a complete, not complete, but there is a lack of cross-pollination of ideas. So when I'm traveling, especially in Europe, where a lot of the innovations are taking place, you know, so you can buy, as I was telling you all, leather made out of grape seeds, silks that are made out of food crop waste, uh, algae, mushrooms, everything that's organic, compostable, they're making the best silks, the best fabrics are coming out of it. And they are not coming just out of designer interventions. They are coming out because tech geeks, biochemical engineers are collaborating with designers. You know, so perhaps it's easy to think about it in places like Denmark where the population is me looking out of my Bandra house. The entire population is from my back window. So I know what the challenges are, but I think we need to spread I keep talking about the tribe, but being interested in these innovations and what the technology can do, uh, I think it, it should be a personal quest because the world is moving really fast with innovation. And in Copenhagen Fashion Summit, uh, the entries from India are the maximum number, right? There's like 151 countries that apply, blah, blah, blah. Always, maximum number of entries are from India. But there's a massive difference between what we propose as Indian entrepreneurs and what, let's say, Scandinavians propose, you know, because they do have the tech facilities, innovation studios, where you are meant to sit there and get different stakeholders from different parts of the industries and disciplines to come and collaborate. So you need to be self-motivated to actually go out there and see who you can collaborate, whose brains you can pick. Um, so that's what I see as far as sustainability is concerned. But when I go and give talks all over, you know, my focus really is, I never forget that where I come from is India. And India had a sustainability program, ideology, I won't even call it a program, sustainability ideology from day one. We are the land of Ayurveda, yoga. I mean, what wasn't sustainable about it? Ayurveda is based on plants and herbs, right? I mean, you could cure any disease with that. We've lived with all these self-sustaining um, philosophies and practices, and we forget to dip back into it. So when I talk about sustainability, I talk about it from a very emotional, ideological, philosophical level. Because if it doesn't come from the heart, then your practice will end whenever you can make ends meet. You know, when there's a shortcut, then you will take the shortcut. But if it comes from inside your heart, and that's the reason why I talk about Gandhi. Um, when I talk about Gandhian principles and how we can apply it to our businesses, especially in the high-end luxury business, because um, if the whole I sorry. Thank you. 
I mean, it, it would be great because uh, innovation is innovation, and I think if you have alternatives to not killing millions of cows to get the leather, and you know, those are things that's good for humanity. With India, the talk on sustainability is many pronged, okay? Because, because sustainability is not just about the leather that you're replacing. Sustainable practices is about minimum wage, fair wage. Artisans, we have 11 million artisans that work in India, okay? And I would give it to you in writing that they are not the, the most well paid. Even some of the top designers are using them. They have them in hordes, in factories, all your lehenga cholis with all the exquisite embroideries are not being made by designers sitting in their studio. They're being made by karyagars, right? Now, are they being paid a fair wage? Are they being paid a, what, we need to know what's the difference between minimum wage and, and, and a living wage. So, you know, we are a rural economy. Like we keep forgetting in the hustle and bustle of only thinking India is a metropolitan cities. 80% of it is thrived on rural economy. Pre-colonization, it was a thriving rural economy. 35% of the global GDP came from India pre-colonization. When the British left, it was literally less than 5% that was left to us because it had been completely uh, uh, bastardized and looted uh, because of colonization. So what happened in that process is artisans who lived with dignity, they lived within their ecosystem. Every village had their weavers, dyers, tailors, that ecosystem facilitated their livelihood. They could have the children running around, but they're weaving, as we all know. Where do they keep the looms? They keep the looms in their home, next to the puja, next to the kitchen. They go and, the kids go and play cricket when they come in the week. We, we know that well, right? Because it is such an inherent part of their livelihood, their day-to-day -day lives. And that has been dismantled. So when we talk about sustainability, and for anyone who wants to use craft, remember that every time you're using craftspeople in cities, they're literally dislocated, dislodged artisans. They have left their villages. Designers like Rahul Mishra, for instance, he started doing something called reverse migration. He's like, he'll pay them to go back home. Go back, join your family, join your ecosystem of friends and family and cows and you know, agriculture, whatever you had. And they work through WhatsApp, they use social media. And now he pays them to go back home. And it, the cat is a sustainable practice. So this is not just about having leather. This is a very intrinsic solution for our creators in our country if we realize that we cannot keep living in the upper echelon thinking that what we do doesn't affect uh, people in, in rural India, okay? Because it is a rural economy when we talk about artisanal skills. Um, yeah. yeah um, I'm glad you uh, talk about the artisans because the way we uh, were approaching uh, the conversation around sustainability, uh, I was seeing them in four concentric circles, starting with the self, where we are concerned about the harmful elements or organic food, you know, all of things that we consume or, you know, non azodyes because they hurt our skin or they're cancerous and all of that, non-lead uh, dye stuff and all of that. Moving to the environment where then the largest noise, the largest conversation is about, where, you know, the environment should not be hurt. Um, for me, and sustainability is a much larger issue than just health, and uh, uh, environment. The third circle, which is around your business practices, which is not just ethical and uh, fair wages, but a complete practice of integral entrepreneurship, where you think of the whole value chain and think of yourself uh, not as an owner, but as a custodian of the value. Yeah. And the last one, and most importantly, uh, the human aspect. And for India as a country, when we talk about sustainable practices, we cannot talk about it without thinking about the artisans that, that you spoke about. 
but even when you look at certification, even if you look at fair trade, even if you look, look at uh, correct, rightful practices, fair wages and all of that, we are still talking about one fundamental thing which I disagree with, which we are treating the artisan still as a pair of hands. But nothing more than that because we are not inviting him or her to the kitchen or to be part of the value chain. We are telling them, don't use your brain. You don't need to. We will do the thinking for you. You know, we'll bring the emotion. You just execute. So as long as we treat like that, we will, they will always be at the bottom most level of the value chain. So how, uh, how do you see it? A uh, year and a half back, I was at to talk with the United Nations, and I'm part of NEST, which is an NGO that supports artisans all over the world. And we went there to actually make a plea and a policy change where we empower what we call the handworker economy. So how the handworker economy works is that, imagine village after village, artisans are not just, they're not weaving they're being dumped a uh, fast fashion t-shirt. So every time you're picking up a fast fashion t-shirt and there's a little embroidered butterfly, some hand is doing it, okay? Most of that kind of work is being done by women. 80% of manufactured goods are being made by, manufactured clothes are being made by women like this. And they're living in parts of India which are, where there's no representation for them. They're not working in a big factory with 20,000 people with state-of-the-art equipment where they have labor laws to look after them. So what we went to the United Nations to say was that these practices are anti-women. because It was mostly women producing them. So it became a gender issue. Then we started talking about it as being a human rights issue. Because there is a woman who's sent off for two little kids, sits in the chart boy, in a tiny room. She's paid per unit, a basic amount per unit. And she has to churn it out to make any substantial amount to feed herself and the kids. And she's not protected by any law. She's, so this, these are called the invisible makers of our clothes. So our quest has to be to make people visible. But we cannot treat them that, like they did not exist. And I love something called fashion revolution. You know, when the Rana, Rana factory in Bangladesh collapsed, and thousands of people, mostly women, you know, lost their lives because they were in the most dilapidated building, no security, no exit, undernourished, uh, underventilated, you name it. There was no, no one looking out for their rights, and it collapsed. And there was a massive photo I remember seeing in New York Times when they had a picture of all the mothers who had lost their lives, and all these kids trying to figure out where, where their mother was, you know. And that led um, a dear friend of mine called Andrew, Andrew Morgan, who's an um, Oscar-winning documentary filmmaker. He was so appalled, and he doesn't do anything on fashion, but he was so appalled by this condition that he made a documentary, which I urge all of you to watch, called The True Cost, The True Cost of basically Making film, uh, Fashion. And that, sho that shows you how the degradation that we have inflicted on people because of our consumers' choices. If you don't think twice about picking up a t-shirt that costs $3, you, you buy coffee now that costs $5, but, you know, and you say, oh my God, so cheap. You know, someone is paying for it. It may not be you, but someone sitting in Cambodia, in Bangladesh, in India, in Indonesia, someone is paying the cost for it. It is absolutely fundamentally wrong that a t-shirt Think about a t-shirt. This is, this is actually written about uh, amazing futurist from the University of Singularity in San Francisco. He says the tragedy of the most common denominator of what we wear, a t-shirt, how it is made. First, the cotton is harvested in one country, right? Then it is sent to another country for it to be beaten, in, beaten and bleached. Then it's sent to another country for it to be turned into yam. Then it's sent to another country to be turned to cut and so on. Then another country for the embellishments and the buttons or whatever is required. Then it goes to America where someone puts a big slogan that says, I love USA. And then 
you're paying, when you buy it, you're paying $2 for it, then you shove it under your cupboard, not to look at it again. That's, that's the consumption pattern. That's how your t-shirt is made. So someone is paying the price when you're paying $3 for it. So this whole idea of cheaper is better, faster, not fewer, is killing the environment. Every year we produce 150 billion clothes per year. That means each one of us and everyone on Earth gets to have 20 new clothes every year. There's absolutely no need for this. You know, Gandhi himself said, there's enough for everyone's needs, but not for everyone's greed. And that's the level that we've reached. And we may not think twice about it because our immediate environment may not look as, as disgusted and dilapidated because of the environmental degradation. But go into the outskirts, see the landfills, the millions of clothes that go into landfills, they release carbon dioxide, they toxify water supply. So it changes the whole fabric of the environment and the people living in these environments. So we have to be cognizant of the fact, when I throw my or t-shirt, where does it go? It goes somewhere. It doesn't go into the air, right? So I always urge our children, you know, I'm not the kind of person who say don't buy. I love good things. I love well-designed things. I love made by hand. But I want to love my clothes. Enough to keep them for a very, very long time, to be able to pass it on. Enough to pay extra for quality, for value, so I don't throw it away. So these are individual choices. We forget it's our individual collective choices that is going to make a difference. We've forgotten the power of our own purse. So I... Yeah. Banda, I will share with you one of the biggest lessons that was taught to us. Gitanjali and I, we were in conversation uh, once with Bridget Singh. Uh, you know, Bridget Singh in, in Jaipur, yeah, the, the print press. She has huge disdain for consumer, consumerism. And she described it in very beautiful words. She said, do you, we don't even stop to think what the word consumer means. To consume means to destroy, to kill, to finish. Right? And a consumer we call somebody who is actually destroying the things. You are buying and killing them. So she, would say, so she distinguished between a consumer who kills products and a customer who preserves it. And I think this is a very, very interesting uh, perspective where we say, do I want to, am I happy killing 20 garments or am I happy living with four? Yeah. I think uh, fashion has played fashion journalism and I have to say I did my fair share of talking about trends and creating a system where you know you create cycles <coughs> just so you can discard your last season's clothes. But I promise you the world is changing in the sense that it's it's the consumers themselves and I have to say it's the millennials, post millennials who are appalled by their parents consuming patterns also. Okay? Um, there's an amazing futurist and lack of a better word, she's a trend forecaster called Lee Edelkut. She's Dutch. And a few years back in Indaba, which is a design conference in South Africa, she presented what's called the Anti-Fashion Manifesto, which like, literally became quite a sensation because at a time when everyone's glorifying fashion, she just went down and wrote a brutally honest white paper on what is wrong with the global fashion industry that includes what we do here. And and it tackles everything that, the most important thing that tackles is the absurdity of the season. And how absurdly India embraced it when, you know, first of all, according to uh, Vedanta, we have six seasons, right? Um, so forget the, the four seasons. But the cycle of fashion, autumn, winter, spring, summer, the way we have been taught the coerced almost to follow a very European pattern has done nothing for our industry. We're still so confused. We're supposed to show automated clothes <laughs> in Bombay. It's absolutely absurd. So it doesn't work. And this whole towing the line because the, the, the diktats are coming from the 
capitals of Paris and Milan. We've got to shake ourselves out of this post-colonial blues, as I call it. You know, we need to reclaim our own seasons, our own fabrics. And, um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we keep forgetting 5,000-year-old civilization that taught the world everything, and we're still sort of scrounging around to get nuggets of wisdom from the outside world. Yeah, which actually brings me to the conversation about Gandhi. Yeah. Uh, guys, this is a um, very interesting conversation because neither of us knew what we are thinking. So this is literally like jamming and I'm going to particularly love talking about Gandhi and uh, the perspective of Gandhi and what relationship he would have with fashion, with sustainability, and everything that we just described until now. I would love to hear what you have. I'll give you the shorter version, because this is actually a good half an hour speech that I wrote. But because I'm also not speaking to an alien audience where I have to spell out who Gandhi is, usually when I'm traveling overseas. But Gandhi had a profound relationship with his clothes. And when I started my research, I found a phenomenal essay written by Professor Gonzalez in the Rome University, who's a Gandhi expert. And the title of the essay was called Half-Naked Fakir, Gandhi's Search for Sartorial Integrity. You know, I never even read uh, sartorial. sartorial. Sartorial means fashion, basically. So it's a synonym for fashion. Sartorial Integrity. To put sartorial... It's like saying fashion integrity and Gandhi's search for it. It was baffling. A brilliant essay that was written, which talks about three stages of Gandhi's life. One, when he went to England, where he was wearing his three piece suits, wanted to be very anglicized, hated being an Indian, was embarrassed, you know, that he could speak English well. He started learning the piano, did everything to look like an English gentleman, dressed to the core. So he had that whole time when accepting his Indianness was not part of his agenda. He just wanted to be like the British. And then he studies law, and then he goes to South Africa. At that time in South Africa, there were two types of Indians who were in South Africa. The laborers, and then there were the gentrified Indians, like Gandhi, who came as lawyers, as professionals. But because of the bigoted government, all Indians were labeled equally. They, that was the time when they were called coolies. It didn't matter if you had a law degree, you're a lawyer, or you were indentured help. You were just... And Gandhi would, did not like that at all. He couldn't understand how he, this gentleman who speaks impeccable English, lawyer, dressed well, should be clubbed with this whole mass of Indians who were poor and laborers. So one day he gets onto a train with his three-piece suit, first-class ticket, looking like a gentleman, and he gets booted out. Then he realizes it didn't matter to them that he was affluent, that he had a first-class ticket. And as he gets out, he runs into Bala Sundaram, who's a laborer who's been beaten black and blue, bleeding. And that was a massive turning point in Mahatma Gandhi's life. He felt embarrassed. He felt embarrassed that he lived his life in such a vacuous, empty way, not understanding the plight of fellow Indians. So he promised himself that he would go on his path, which later on became the, the beginning of Swadeshi and Swaraj, right? Where he was going to empower himself. He went and worked as a nurse in the poor war in Africa, um, understood the pains of people at war. He started a community life there, farm community, with common living, common sharing. And at that time, to identify with the laborers, and bring the rich Indians and the poor Indians together, he started wearing what's called the morning dress, which is the white dhoti and the white kutta. So that was a massive sartorial shift in his life. And he did that deliberately, okay, to show to the world that he had made an inner commitment through his clothes to let the world know his journey had started. So it was on a trajectory of its own. Now, then he goes to India. When he goes to India, he goes, travels, the length and breadth of the country and realizes how pathetic a country is in, what pathetic state the country is in. This is the time when um, cotton was being bought very cheaply from India. We were the biggest growers of cotton. We were weaving that cotton in every village. 
I mean, Acharka is there for a reason in our flag, in the middle of the flag. There's such a big symbol of our, of, of Swadeshi, right? Of self-sustenance, self-reliance. All that was uprooted because of colonization. So, and all the cotton went to mills in Lancashire and parts of England. That was the beginning of fast fashion, I think, because they made it into cheap clothes, sent them back, back to India. We know this history. And then we had to, Indians had to buy it at a high margin. And that skilled our economy. The textile industry overnight went bankrupt. Our textile industry. So that's why we started the Khadi movement, and we know what happened. I'm not going to go into that. But at the time when the Khadi movement started, and we urged people, burn the clothes from England. Burn it. Spin your own clothes, and that movement started. We realized at that time that there were people who were so poor, they had no clothes to burn. So at that time, there was another big shift that happened, where he was embarrassed that he still hadn't understood the human condition. And that's when he rose and wears the loincloth as his identification with the poorest of the poor. When he went to England, when he had to sign this papers, um, and Winston Churchill touted, mocked him and said, oh, that half naked fakir. Gandhi took it as a compliment. He said, finally, now you know. When you call me a half naked fakir, that means now you know I identify, you see me identify with the poorest of the poor. So this kind of story is unheard of in the, in the history of politics. The clothes have played such a significant role in this sartorial journey. So this is what's meant by sartorial integrity, in his, his own journey. Uh, so I only speak within the purview of clothes, of course. But then I started researching more into, like, what are the principles we talk about? Swadeshi, Swaraj, uh, uh, you know, Ahimsa. And it is so much part of the sustainability talk. If you talk about Ahimsa, it is at the core of sustainability. Because according to Gandhi, what he said, Ahimsa is not like a piece of cloth that you take off and on at will. It has to sit in your heart and be an intrinsic part of yourself. Because what does Ahimsa mean? It is non-violence in thought, deed, and action. That involves everything, human to human, human to environment. So it, it became such a powerful ideology. The more I research about it, the biggest names uh, global economist E.M. Schumacher he wrote papers based on economics and Ahimsa. The Green Peace Movement by um, Mr. Galton, completely influenced by uh, Gandhi's Ahimsa. Um, this, numerous people, the Peace Movement, the Green Movement, they all owe their ideology to Gandhi. And so it's time that we start revisiting ideas of Ahimsa in our own business practices. They're not alien to us, but we need to repackage it, we need to refurbish it, re refreshen it, uh, and make it intrinsic to, to our way of doing work, the way we respect giving dignity to people. What a beautiful, you have to have an Ahimsa way of thinking when you're doing your business. Um, look at, um, so we have Aparagriya. What does Aparigriya mean? You know, it's again at the heart of environmental issue. But the environment, nature, we are mere custodians. We are just trustees. That's what he said. And that was one of the vows that he took. That we are mere trustees and it is up to us to make sure it's in good condition when we pass it on to the next generation. Sarvodaya, we talked a lot about Sarvodaya, which means welfare for all. It's not just you and me. And how can there be Sarvodaya Welfare for all, if we keep looking at each other's countries as just a uh, destination for cheap labor, uh, cheap uh, handicraft, whatever, all the resources that come from our country, which is just being pillaged without giving dignity of labor uh, to the ones who make these things. So all these, uh, these notions and vows and all the things that we've learned alongside we learned when we learned the history of Gandhi's journey in India, they are all applicable to our daily lives. If you just sit back to revisit and see how these notions fit within your beautiful business plans. And I think this must be a reminder for all of us that uh, it's a time that we need to dig deep ideologically. 
So on the one hand, we could talk about innovation, all the tech guys are doing this and that or whatever, but if it doesn't come from your heart, it's not going to sustain you for the rest of your life. That's the gist. Thank you. Um, Banda, um, so I'll share with you what Gandhi and fashion means to me. You uh, absolutely correctly pointed out the idea of ahimsa and sustainability and uh, its practice towards human, towards environment, to ourselves, to the materials we use and all of that. But there is another message that Gandhi gave to us, probably not as clearly, he didn't explain it in economic terms, he explained it in uh, more sociological terms, more political terms at that moment, which was uh, the Swadeshi, the Charkha, because it meant taking your uh, own self in charge and Swaraj and Swadeshi and all of that. But actually, why Charkha? For me, that was very, very significant because the Charkha, which is hand spinning, is actually the link. It manifested the broken link in the otherwise a complete rural industrial chain in, in our country. So when you talked about the cotton starting that started to be exported to Manchester to feed the mills there, what was taken away from the rural economy that made it collapse? The spinning. And the spinning from hand spinning that was uh, pra being practiced actually moved to machine spinning. And the machine spinning caused so much damage to the environment that we haven't even stopped to question it even today. The first thing it has done is the movement of the cotton all over the world. Secondly, the bailing and the unbailing process. And the, the violence that the cotton is um, uh, undergoing is enormous. But the biggest fallout for India that we are still suffering from is the kind of cotton that, was, that we were growing then and that we started to grow after independence thanks to this movement to industrial spinning. The industrial spinning could not take the short staples, so we moved after decades of all our research or innovation went into moving the agriculture from desi cotton, which was multiple varieties all over the country, into long staple American variety. Desi cotton was rain fed, it did not need any, any irrigation, it did not need any tending to it, did not, you could recycle the seeds. The farmer had to do nothing. And suddenly you bring a foreign cultivation, foreign seeds, which the farmer was not comfortable with, didn't know anything about, you needed, uh, you started to have, because they were foreign, you started to get pest attacks, you needed fertilization, you need uh, uh, water, and so much water that goes into it. As a result, the, uh, the farmer lost entirely in the process the control over his crop. But not just he started to be in debt because he had to buy the seeds, he had to pay for the fertilizers, he had to pay for the power, he had to pay for all of that upfront before the, uh, the, the market could uh, even fetch anything for, for the produce, which was not even certain. Because now suddenly, if the rain, uh, there was a drought, there was death for it. Not just. So during all this process, we have killed the environment, we have killed the local economy, we have killed the farmer. And the biggest fallout, we have killed the competitive advantage of India. You don't see this jacket anymore, you don't see this shirt anymore. Because this cannot be produced by uh, industrial production. We can keep talking about going uh, more advances towards uh, fabrics, but we have so much that India can offer that no one else in the world can. But we have paid no attention when it comes to innovation to reinstating or creating a possibility to spin that short staple into 
an economically viable scale. That's all India needs. And for me, that message of Gandhi has gone completely missing. So if we were to bring that back and focus on our innovation, to bring that ability to use desi cotton into multiple beautiful forms of cotton and cotton fabrics, we will not be able to, um, you know, we'll have a very clear advantage. The farmers will regain the, uh, the dignity. The local economy, uh, economy and the artisans will regain the uh, dignity. The whole conversation between power loom and hand loom will disappear because those kind of yarns can only be woven on hand loom. They will produce unique fabrics. And so much, if you then bring in the ecosystem of design of uh, multiple things, there's so much possible. But we pay no attention to this aspect. Which actually brings me to the, uh, we're running out of time, but the, the last part, which is, Again, a very big trend that you've seen that you would like to maybe talk about the movement towards non-homogeneity. And this whole trend of non-homogeneity is actually could, if we were able to create the, those unique pieces that don't need industrial scale anymore, would feed right into our competitive advantage. How do you how do you see non-homogeneity? Do you see what role India can play and all of that? I I, I feel wherever I look around, no matter where I go, it's it's almost there's there's a big outcry against globalization. And when I say against globalization, I'm not necessarily talking purely economic ways. I'm talking about imagine the fashion industry. Everyone started wearing everything. We all started looking like clones of each other, right? Because trends were dictated. Um, and now, because of how the era just turned, it all talks about diversity and LGBTQ rights and cultural diversity. You know, it suddenly became un uh, it became acceptable, and you could celebrate the fact that you're different. I mean, I take pride in saying I'm Nepali. You know, I I was born in a village in Sikkim. Like, I just feel so proud to say it. Maybe 15 years back, while I was in getting a very fine education with very fine people or whatever, I may have felt embarrassed to say it. So what's happening is people are just, there's an outcry now because this, the younger generation who's becoming the next uh, range of customer, customers don't want to look like anyone else, you know? Um, that this level of embracing their own cultural identity is going to change the fabric of fashion and what we are going to buy. So much so, the big designer brands, international brands today, they will go to Croatia and pick up a beautiful Croatian shirt that is made by the indigenous people there. Their motifs mean something. You know, it's like going to Nagaland and buying a shawl and not understanding that that shawl is made because there's a certain tribe that makes it in a certain way. There's a certain color and a pattern that is followed because that's how they recognize their tribes. So these big designers will go dip into other people's cultures and take out something beautiful, put it on a ramp in the international ramp shows. And the moment they do that, they have the right to it. So there was a case with Christian Dior when they used, used a Romanian shirt. Beautiful. They didn't do anything to it. There's, this is not a design intervention. It literally took a beautiful vintage Romanian shirt, the whole thing, put it on the ramp, and now they have the right to claim it because that's how their legal structure is built. So the Romanians fought back. Social media, there was a huge outcry. A friend of mine even started a, a, a company now, which is so. This doesn't come under the purview of intellectual property rights. So she's created something called cultural intellectual property, property rights. So she's going to represent countries, regions, indigenous people, where she sees that big brands have just pilfered their, their century-year-old designs, not given them credit, not given any margin of the profit. They're selling that, that shirt 
for thousands of dollars in the shops in Paris or Milan or wherever, and nothing goes back to the very community where it was just picked up from. So these sort of um, watchdog uh, entrepreneurs are coming up dime a dozen, and they're not going to let people sit down and take advantage of cultures. Even in India, there's a big movement now, you know, um, on social media, that's it. If someone disrespectfully takes something, uh, what we call culture appropriation, if that happens, we be called out. The, and they have to remove their clothes from their racks uh, because social media is so strong when it comes to these kind of opinions. So which is a good sign, which is a great sign for countries that, ha that are couched in history and heritage. You know, for far too yep. long, India has given the best of embroideries to the best of brands and never got credit for it, you know. Yeah, our cultural appropriation is a, is a big one. Um, we just look at India and uh, again, guys, uh, this is not just um, a wake up call, but a strong urge because if we don't do it now, somebody else will appropriate it and do it for you. Um, yoga, Ayurveda, who's doing it? Who's making it and bringing it to the world? I don't see any Indian name. Why are we shy? Why don't we? We have the ability, we have the capabilities. What's, what's wrong? Uh, yes, pure practices, yes, but I'm saying in form of cultural appropriation, yoga is now as Norwegian as, as, uh, as Indian. And so, they've, uh, they've, yeah. they've, they've claimed it in a way where they've made it into an industry, right? Everything is the opposite of whatever yoga stands for, um, it's the opposite. So they've made it about fitness, being sexy. I mean, yoga is so sexualized now. I live in <laughs> Bali. It is, I can't go and practice in a group because it's about what you wear. So they all look like from Victoria's Secret catalog because <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's really sexualized clothes. It's about fitness. Yoga Sutra says, first line, it's like the cessation of the mind. That's what yoga is for, right? It's got, and of course, the fact that you get fit in the process, that's an incredible bonus. But that's not the purpose of yoga. So now in Bali, it's been claimed by mostly foreigners who come there and set up businesses. So you can do yoga on a surfboard, you can do yoga with a pet. You can, <laughs> there's one that just started where you can do yoga with a glass of wine. Um, so there's that level. So there is, I mean, when I come back to so, India and, you know, maybe we tend to surround ourselves with like-minded people, but there is a huge need for us to reclaim our heritage. And no one should be given the mantle of the responsibility. It should be us living here, living here. We've had mothers, grandfathers passed down all these traditions to us. It is up to us, you know. And I'm just surprised. You probably know this. I don't want to take up Anymore. But all the big businessmen who could be like, you know, I'm, for lack of a better word, I'm going to say business. But why don't we have beautiful institutions that can teach the right way or have the philosophy behind it? Why aren't we doing it? It's not like we don't have money in this country. I have friends who can open It's hard. Yoga, it's uh, the short yoga. answer is there are choices for business people to make. Uh, hard nose money chases um, uh, the quickest way to make some more. Uh, uh, I think, um, uh, but that, as uh, we've, we've discussed, we've evoked, should not be at, um, at crosses with what India can offer, what sustainability can do, what Ahimsa practices can do. Um, well, you know, I hope that with all the efforts with this new generation, you guys uh, will have the ambitions and the abilities to build on what you leave from here and think big. And thinking big 
is not just scale but impact. Thank you. Thank you, Banda. And uh,